It is my honor to welcome Mr. Navneet Vibhav today for our interview series on exploring the opportunities in environmental law. Mr. Vibhav is a partner at Khetan & Co, who has been advising and representing clients in diverse environment-related matters for various sectors before the Honorable Supreme Court of India and the NGT. He is a member of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. He has received awards and fellowships from Bellsco, Robert Bosch Foundation, Asian Development Bank, and Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Mr. Vibhav also has a varied experience in academia, where he has taught environmental law and energy law at NLU Delhi and Jindal Global Law School, and has also authored multiple books. I'm also pleased to introduce to you Ms. Rishika Khare as an expert moderator. Ms. Khare is an assistant professor of law at NLUO and has expertise in various subjects, including environmental law. She has completed her LLM from Edinburgh Law School and her uh, dissertation focused on addressing domestic effects of climate change through state constitution and human rights law. We also have with us today our faculty advisor, Dr. Sohini Mahapatra, who has been a faculty member at NLUO since 2016. Dr. Mahapatra has an expertise in various subjects, including animal law, and has recently published her book titled Non-Humans and the Law, an analysis of animal welfare and animal rights within the Indian legal discourse. Mr. Vibhav, we are pleased to have you with us today, and we thank you for taking out the time to talk to us and agreeing to guide young law students on the paths of environmental law as a career opportunity. Without thank you for further, inviting me. Thank you so thank much, you. sir. Without any further ado, I will now request Yashwadin to take the conversation ahead with our esteemed guest, Mr. Vibhav. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, sir. I would once again like to thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Good morning. Sir, big... Beginning with the set of questions that we have, the very first question that we had was that if you could tell us about your first academic pursuit, how did you actually choose law as a career option and what was your experience at Nazar Hyderabad? So, uh, I mean, uh, that's, of course, a very interesting, uh, I have a very interesting answer to that because, uh, so uh, law was nowhere uh, on the radar in terms of uh, career option for me. And uh, so I was typically a science student, you know, and parents expect you to prepare for IIT and stuff. and. Uh, so that's exactly what I was doing. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I didn't study very hard in my class 11th and 12th. So I didn't really kind of uh, uh, get through IIT in my first attempt. I got through the National Defense Academy. And uh, in fact, even went to Khadakwasla. And then my parents were very <clears throat> keen that I, uh, you know, uh, come back and uh, maybe write, uh, uh, you know, something, I mean, study something else, or uh, prepare for IIT again. And that's when I got to know of law and uh, of the various national law schools. And I wrote three entrance exams. Uh, of course, I was waitlisted in NLS Bangalore. And uh, Nalsar and NLU Jodhpur are the other two exams that I had written. I got through Nalsar and Jodhpur. And I had taken admission again and sent my check for admission to Jodhpur. And then someone told me, suggested that I go to Nalsar. So of course, that's how uh, I reached the law school. And uh, so yeah, I think uh, it was by chance. But then I realized that uh, law actually gives you uh, quite a few uh, career options. I mean, it, it, it gives you the flexibility to actually get into a lot of things. So I think I read a bit about uh, what are the career options that, you know, a law graduate can actually uh, sort of uh, opt for. And uh, so I thought, uh, and somewhere I think it's also a choice of doing something different from what the, what others are doing. And uh, I think that has stayed with me in terms of my uh, choice for practice area also. So, you know, and typically uh, you don't want to do something which everyone does. So you want to distinguish yourself from the crowd. So I think uh, that's how I ended up studying law. Yeah. So, sir, the second question that we have is that what drove you to pursue an LLM in environmental law and why did you choose Lewis and Clark Law School in particular? So, uh, of course, so while at law school, my five-year, uh, you know, law at Nalsar, uh, one of the things you also do as a student, which I'm sure you guys are also uh, kind of uh, doing at this stage, is uh, trying to figure out as to what, what is it that you want to do in life. And of course, the obvious choice for most of us to go to a, a you know, a, in, a talk to your firm and get a job there, a high paying job. So uh, that was, of course, was like any other uh, law student. And uh, one of the things uh, which I was also trying to figure out was, uh, you know, uh, what next? What is one area which I would want to specialize in and all of that? So, uh, of course, I did the typical corporate law and various other areas of uh, the co corporate commercial areas of law. Uh, but then one thing I also 
uh, I mean, I had a great interest in as a student was environmental law because uh, my dad uh, has been a, a I mean, of course, now he's retired. So he uh, was a professor of zoology. So that's why as a kid, you know, I would always go on these uh, field trips with him sometimes and go to these animal houses you have in departments. And, you know, so I was very fond of animals generally uh, and nature. And because if you grow up, uh, you know, in that kind of environment, then clearly uh, you develop a kind of interest. Uh, so that, of course, was there. And I think uh, somewhere uh, when I started working my first job, uh, you know, at AZB in Bombay, and uh, I was lucky, like, you know, uh, uh, when I graduated, I actually sat for three jobs and got all the three. And the criteria was pretty simple that whoever pays you the highest amount of money, uh, you go work there and nothing wrong with that. So, of course, I went where I did. And then I realized that uh, that state, uh, that, that interest in environment, of course, stayed with me. And I uh, fortunately, uh, you know, I was uh, I was keen to I was I also had this. You can say that uh, uh, somewhere I still had that uh, urge to go and sort of like, you know, study for an LM after five years, because usually a lot of kids I think you know, five years is a lot of time after that clearly don't want to study. So. I was still kind of uh, interested for the rankings. Uh, so I simply saw the Princeton Review rankings in the US News and Reports rankings. And uh, so Lewis and Clark has ranked number one. And I was very clear that I want to do a specialized LLM. I didn't want to do a general LLM, which is what most people opt for to also play safe and take credits from various uh, uh, areas of law. Uh, so yeah, I think the choice was obvious because it was the number one. And I thought, uh, let me apply. If I uh, get a scholarship, then of course, uh, That'll make my life easy. And I was also very clear that if I get a scholarship only, then I'll go. Uh, fortunately, it worked uh, the way I had expected. I got a scholarship, almost 100% scholarship. And uh, so that's how I landed up there. And I had also done some research in terms of asking people, uh, say, academicians in the US and my seniors from law school as to you know, what would be a, a good choice if I want to study environment, energy, and climate change or something similar. And uh, a lot of people who are aware of uh, you know, this uh, area of law, they said that... Uh, that's pretty much the best. I mean, it's consistently ranked number one or two in the US. So, so I think the choice was obvious. And of course, I did my research, which everyone, every every student should do. And uh, just I was just lucky. I got a scholarship and uh, yeah, got admission also. So, if you could share your experience at Lewis and Clark Law School and how was it different from the Indian curriculum that we generally have. So uh, then I would say in 2009, when I'd gone to study, of course, uh, there was much of a difference in terms of how uh, uh, law or anything was. Uh, so, you know, uh, it was being taught in uh, U.S. law schools. I think over the years, uh, Indian law schools have also changed and improved, uh, changed for the better. I think uh, uh, now the way uh, law is being taught in most law schools in India is almost uh, similar to what uh, the way it is in the U.S. or, you know, uh, anywhere else because the case law method of teaching and, you know, uh, so I think I think uh, clearly now, if you see it, I think uh, the quality of legal education being imparted in the country is quite good because you have these internships and you know the, all kinds of mentorship programs, and you have these elective courses, and uh, you have most of the law schools try and get people from the industry to come and teach them. Uh, uh, you know, so so I think uh, as of now there is not much of a difference. But uh, then when I had gone, I think there was quite a, a bit of a difference. And one area which I would definitely want to highlight is uh, you know, the kind of. Uh, 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 you know, effort which people put in in terms of writing, uh, 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 you know, the research papers. Because uh, as as a kid, you know, who was as a student studying fifty subjects at in a five year course at the law school, you know, and then we, when we had this, uh, uh, you know, uh, requirement that uh, you have to submit a research paper for twenty five marks for each subject that you study, you end up writing close to fifty papers. And uh, of course, the quality when you write fifty papers in uh, five schools is, I would say it's questionable, but I mean, clearly you could have done better. So uh, of course, when I, I was writing my uh, LLM dissertation and all of that at the law school, uh, there are quite a few things that I learned, you know, in terms of that everything that you write, you reference and how it should be very well researched, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the originality of thought. And if you're even picking up some idea from somewhere, you have to acknowledge that, which should, we tend to not do uh, many a times, so which is of course, uh, in many ways, unethical also. So, uh, so I think uh, there were quite a few things I learned, and I think that has clearly helped me thereafter in the profession also. So even now, of course, when you write these columns and stuff in the newspapers, you don't have like really heavily reference everything. But uh, if you're writing anything for any journal or anything of that sort, I think uh, so that that has made me, I would say, uh, a better writer, more disciplined, I would say, and uh, also, you know, how you think, how you how you think uh, that also. So I think I think uh, see, it's a huge value addition because you end up. Uh, not just interacting with your professors, also students who come from 
So one of the good things about Lewis and Clark and the environmental, of course, is that uh, you know they take very few students in the masters. So I think if I remember well, there were just like fifteen students. And uh, that time, after one year of work experience, I was the youngest. The person next uh, to me, you know, was I think I was about in my mid twenties or whatever. And uh, there's a difference. I think six, seven years. So most of the average age of my classroom then was I would say close to forty. Because there were these professionals who had actually worked for twenty years. There was someone uh, who was running for the governorship in I think North or South Dakota. So you know, so uh, you had such people coming in who are very experienced, who have seen life, who have seen the profession. So uh, it was a very enriching experience in terms of the classroom experiences also. And more than that, I think uh, one reason I would always recommend someone uh, at some stage to you know to uh, go for a master's something like that because. Uh, the exposure in terms of not just the classroom, the learning, but also as a person, like you know, you meet a lot of people from across the world. So, uh, uh, my best friend in my class, LM class, was this guy who had worked for Jones Day Tokyo for quite some time. He was of course senior. I mean, he was I think uh, uh, I think 34, so maybe seven years uh, older to me. But you know, and we'd go play uh, baseball or something together. So, so so much that you learn outside the classroom also so that experience clearly helped and if you're interacting with people who are interested in the same uh, area of law i think that also adds because uh, while you in the classroom of course you study environmental law or climate change or energy or whatever you are specializing in even outside the classroom your conversations kind of are uh, related to that and that i think makes a lot of difference you know so uh, like they say that you know you you live environmental law as they say that you know you you it, it gets up so you have friends who are like you know not even vegetarians vegans and that was that was the first time i actually uh you know learned about a lot of things and uh and the kind of disciplined lifestyle people have and they're so conscious about what they eat and all of that so uh 12 years or 10 11 years back i think you know that was a uh, quite a bit of a learning experience for me so that has clearly helped i have to tell you that so uh you you take the environmental law mode i mean you know you take stetson's international and all of that and and they have, I think, some very prestigious uh, environmental law moats in the U.S. also. They've consistently won that. So I think uh, if someone's really interested in, uh, you know, environmental law, uh, that's the place to be in. And uh, I did my research, and because everywhere else, I mean, I'll, I'll not name the universities here. Uh, you know, you had credits in environmental law, or you had the option. But uh, they, most of the other universities also have specialized elements in environmental law and science and technology and all of that. But that and that was the only option. And I think. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that I actually studied that because that has made a lot of difference in terms of my the way I think and my career choices and everything that I've done in the profession thereafter. Yeah. So this is a broader question that we had that generally in environmental law, there are a very few opportunities that we see are available. Now, if one wants to orient their CV in this niche area of law, is it that just publications suffice or are there some lesser known avenues that we students are not aware about that we can look into? If we want to develop and orient our CV in this particular field, uh, I think uh, in terms of career opportunities, uh, we of course have the law firm option where you can go and work in law firms and uh, you know uh, represent companies and uh, various parties in, in litigation matters, advise on transactional issues, advise on environmental issues in transactions, and there are quite a few. So uh, I think in India also uh, as a jurisdiction, I think uh, uh, this is clearly uh, picked up because uh, you have uh, companies which have become very conscious of environmental issues and all of that. You have EHS professionals who are dedicated professionals in the companies. Uh, you have a lot of think tanks who actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, have these projects on environment. They work on various issues with respect to environment, energy, climate change, there are quite a few of them now. So that is, of course, again, a great uh, career opportunity. Uh, you have uh, a, lot, a lot of NGOs who work on, and they're, they're well-funded, they do exceptional work uh, they take up issues and you know create a whole lot of uh, awareness on issues. Work with the local population uh, and you know also activists. And when I say activists, I mean in a good way because people who are actually concerned about environmental issues and they take it up. And you have a lot of activists actually going to the NGT or the Supreme Court and filing these PIs. So I think that is also required because you want people who actually uh, you know help you uh, you know focus on issues which are. Uh, uh, actually ailing uh, India's national environment. And I think that has to be addressed. So someone has to do that. And uh, so we have to be thankful to these people who are actually, you know, uh, who made their sacrifices and who work so hard in terms of uh, highlighting the environmental problems. And so that, you know, it can be taken up by the concerned uh, stakeholders. So, so of course, in terms of the options, I think you have, you can always work for a law firm as a lawyer, you can be an independent practitioner, 
uh, you can always work for you know the, i mean there are also practitioners who represent the government and the environment ministry and all of that so that's there the pollution control boards uh, you can work for think tanks you can work with an ngo you can be an environmental professional you can be a sustainability officer in one of the companies so i think i think there are quite a few options in terms of the uh, in terms of career choices and in terms of preparing i think uh, internships is what i would say and uh, as a student i think uh, the only things you can do is possibly write if you're interested you can write good papers publish them in uh, good student journals or other places because now we have quite a few of them so i think writing uh, is one option where uh, uh, you should write well researched uh, uh, papers on contemporary environment energy and climate change issues uh, moot courts uh, internships so and, and see i i would always uh, advise that uh, don't uh, like they say you know don't put all your eggs in one basket so even if you're interested in environment that does not mean that you only go and have environmental internships and only write papers which are so as a student i think uh, even if you want to become a good environmental lawyer you have to have a good idea of all other uh, uh, areas of practice also so you have to be generally a good student and uh, and and see things happen gradually if you're interested in a particular area uh, you know, you know always you'll be making choices which are kind of uh, uh, you know uh, related and which will kind of guide you in that direction but having said that i would never advise that you only focus on environment in your five years of law school so uh, it happens gradually but 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 yeah apart from this you should also have uh, other career avenues open so but in terms of environment if you're just talking about i think uh, like i said you know there are quite a few career options and uh, internships are the best way to explore so i would say that you know maybe uh, one internship should be with an ngo the think tank one should be with a law firm which has an environmental mm -hmm. practice so that, you know you have a well rounded view of what uh, you'd be doing or maybe you know you can go and work with a company in an in house uh, team uh, you know maybe and interact with the ehs because when you intern of course you'd work with the legal team and see what are the kind of environmental issues they face how they deal with it they'll have these environmental health and safety professionals interact with them so there are quite a few ways of uh, doing that and uh, i think uh, if you're really interested uh, five years is a lot of time and i think the law school uh, period actually the your duration of the law school gives you a lot of time and opportunities to explore these avenues so you should make good use of that yeah so specifically like when we are targeting let's say like Lewis and Clark Law School. What is it that Lewis and Clark looks for in LLM applications? Because the acceptance ratio is very, it's very creamy, and the layer is also very select students. So, what is it that Lewis and Clark in particular looks into while choosing its candidates for the LLM program? So, uh, I would not say not not just Lewis and Clark. In fact, any uh, you know law school, if when you apply for an LLM, I think. Uh, so when you're going as a fresher, then of course it's a different thing. But then also they'll clearly see that during your five years or your undergrad law course, uh, what have you done? What have you done in that particular area? Do you have uh, publications? Have you done any moot court? And how uh, whether you have won that and all of that? So the idea simply being that see that interest should clearly reflect in your CV because uh, say if you claim that you want to be a say a tax lawyer, then clearly you should have done five things which show that one you are interested in that area of law, and second you are better than average because if you are talking about a uh, course which is like you said that you know so i don't think it's that of course it's selective but uh, uh, but i would say uh, that you know they, they also clearly uh, you know uh, give admission to students who may not have done as much as say someone else because in the classroom also you want to have that diversity you want to have that uh, variety in terms of in the experiences cultures all of that so that's always there but uh, as a student i think uh, there's only so much that can be expected of you and that clearly means that one you should have a good grade and uh, you know you should have a good grade uh, you must uh, be doing the right kind of publications you must be doing the right kind of uh, uh, i would say you know uh, internships so so once you've done all of that and if you're going straight then clearly they'll value that and if you're a professional then there should be some interest maybe you should have worked in a similar area that doesn't mean that you know if you've done corporate law and then you want to go for uh, environmental llm they'll not give you admission but the idea simply is that at some point uh, you have to show that you have a clear interest and uh, you are clearly uh, better or more interested than the other applicants who have applied for the LLM course. So that distinction has to be made. And these are the only ways that you can possibly make that. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah. So transitioning from the academic part and how one can orient their CV, coming to basically the career angle of environmental law. Now, joining a leading and reputing firm like Kedan and Co in environmental law disputes is quite unconventional. 
how did you come across this opportunity so uh, i just tell you so i of course started with doing typical corporate commercial banking and as you know the kind of work first job then i went to uh, uh, masters came back and then i was working for another firm doing uh, practicing uh, energy uh, you know transaction uh, and then i realized that if uh, environment is something that i really want to sort of uh, like you know specialize in at some stage and not many firms uh, had an environment to practice as such you know uh, top tier firms so definitely maybe i should uh, try and build my credentials and uh, so of course and and i didn't have any too many uh, like examples uh, you know which i could possibly follow so i thought the best thing i can possibly do is build my credentials and i thought teaching was the best way to do that because i always say this that you know if you want to learn a subject i think the best way to do that is also teach because when you try and teach you learn it better and you are better prepared so uh, i think uh, i wanted i went back to teaching i taught uh, at uh, a national law school for about 2 to 1 and a half years then i taught at a private uh, law school and and then of course i realized that uh, and uh, now is the time to actually go back to practice because uh, the practice has actually picked up the practice of environmental law so i joined a law firm i worked there and then again i worked i joined this current firm as a partner where i've been working for 3 and 1/2 years so uh, so to say that you know i straight away came here when i said that i wanted to practice environment and uh, you know i started doing that that's not how it is because uh, in the last 12 years after i graduated i have clearly Uh, worked on that uh, gradually you know i have done a few things which i thought would be of relevance and uh, that has clearly helped so you do it over a period of time and clearly uh, this was you know i think it was of course an unconventional choice because uh, when i would tell people even people would ask me that, what do you really do even now when i tell people that i practice environment a lot of people ask me that, what do you do in a law firm when you practice environment so you have to tell them but but i think now uh, when you have a dedicated tribunal and of course you know that we are one of the few countries in the world which has a dedicated tribunal to handle environmental issues you know so so i think uh, that has clearly helped the environmental practice also pick up and i think uh, for a country like india it's very important that you have uh, an environmental law practice so i think uh, you could say the timing and of course uh, the fact that there is a general uh, collective consciousness and uh, people have become more conscientious about environmental issues and all of that so that has helped uh so i think if you're interested that will happen gradually you have to work towards it that's how it's worked for me also and that will work that's how it will work for anyone for that matter in any area of uh, law you have to work towards it gradually and develop your credentials over a period of time yeah so in continuing with our previous question how does an environmental law practice generally pan out in a law firm setup and specifically is there something that our viewers should keep into mind if they're planning to develop their career in environmental law vis-a-vis the corporate setup so uh, see if you're working in a law firm clearly like i said earlier also in the response to one of your questions uh, you have to clearly uh, be mindful that uh, of what is the kind of work that you'd be doing so you'd be of course uh, having companies come to you to advise you on the regulatory framework with respect to environment you'll be you know if there are environmental issues in transactions you'll of course be uh, telling uh, or telling the client what is the right thing to do and uh, all of that Uh, many times you have you certain foreign clients who want to come set shop in india and they want to know what are the regulatory challenges what are the environmental issues because many a times environment is really seen as a red flag you know so uh, uh, a deal breaker as people would say so environmental issues and all of that so so uh, that's not really true so i think as a lawyer your job is also uh, that of a facilitator for uh, businesses so that's one thing and uh, of course uh, uh, you have the typical court work where you go and defend clients uh, or represent them Uh, environmental matters before the national green tribunal before the supreme court and and i think the volume of such cases also increased over the years uh, and of course there is a lot of advisory with respect to the regulatory framework the environmental laws the permits consents everything that you require so that's pretty much the kind of work you typically do in a, a law firm and once in a while i also do some pro bono work where uh, you know uh, where clearly you wouldn't see any conflict with uh, the kind of work you're doing or any client you know so so those are certain uh, i would say limitations but uh, i think uh, you have all kinds of opportunities so that i think sums sums up what i want to respond in terms of yeah so the next question that we have is that in the limited reading that we have done is uh, in that we have seen that there is a growing use of alternate dispute resolution mechanisms in settling environmental law disputes yeah how have you in your experience at khetan and co seen this transitioning so uh, at least in my experience and i can only speak for myself not for my colleagues and others is uh, at least uh, as of now in india 
you don't have too much of uh, alternate dispute resolution mechanisms coming in uh, because typically these are all regulatory uh, kind of matters and uh, you know you have uh, cases before the ngt and the supreme court uh, but uh, what I can definitely tell you is uh, there are a lot of environmental arbitrations which have started happening outside India. So for any of you who are actually reading about it, I think that is one area. I mean, in the next few years, you'll see that happening in India also. So as of now, I think uh, India is still warming up uh, in a lot of ways to this particular discipline, this area of practice. Uh, it will happen gradually. So um, uh, if, you, if you see lawyers in Australia and other places, uh, some of the UK firms, they actually do a lot of work. Uh, where environmental issues are predominantly involved, you know, arbitration work, that's what I'm saying. So, uh, uh, and also like, you know, uh, mediation, all of that. So in US, I know as a matter of fact that, you know, uh, there's a lot of work where you have these alternate, alternative uh, dispute mechanisms involved. So uh, in India, I think uh, maybe in the next few years, not right now. So the last question that we have from us students is that the general perception is that environmental law is an activist subject and generally what people perceive is that environmental law is antithetical to the corporate setup and this is in what we understand not true and how can we change this narrative that these two are not antithetical to each other so i'll tell you uh, and and this is a challenge which i also face you know like uh, a lot of people they'll say that uh, okay you are the lawyer who actually represents the dirty companies and you know you're not doing good to the environment so i think that's uh, simply their ignorance is how i put it because uh, irrespective of what you do as a lawyer, I mean, so one, of course, it's unfair to kind of brand any lawyer as whatever, because I think uh, uh, lawyers like us are doing more service because you're actually telling your client what is the right thing to do. And uh, and uh, I think, uh, so I think that has to change. Because, uh, that's just uh, uh, where uh, a notion where people are just uh, ill-informed about what people are actually doing. So I think a lot of lawyers who actually work in environmental law firms are actually uh, doing a lot of good work for the environment because they're working with the government, they're working with the regulatory agencies, they're working with the clients to tell them what is the right thing to do, what is it that the regulations require you to do, and what is it that is good for the environment. So in a way, you're doing more good to the environment than some others who typically think that you know uh, uh, whatever they're doing will actually serve the purpose. So 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 and 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 I always say this that uh, uh, people who are actually serious about their work, they'll never have these issues or these complaints to raise. So I know a lot of, and, and I, I know a lot of uh, activists who do excellent work in what they do. Something like, something like this from them, because they understand and appreciate what is being done and what every, because each of our, each of us, we are playing our respective roles. So to say that, uh, you know, uh, someone practices a different kind of environmental law, whatever, I mean, this just uh, uh, ignorance. And I, uh, is that, is that uh, that's all I would say, because, uh, as lawyers, I think uh, we do a lot of good work where uh, you know we help the court also many a times in taking and uh, decisions which are actually good for the environment. So because only when you bring these aspects and these details and these examples before the court, the court actually passes orders. So uh, so I think people will gradually understand that and they learn to appreciate the role of lawyers, uh, you know, who are doing that kind of work. Uh, so uh, I think uh, that kind of uh, dispels the myth that uh, it's antithetical. I don't think that's the case because, uh, and I know as a matter of fact, you know, I've, I've interacted with people and so the friends I have in other countries also, and they do excellent work than some of the so-called uh, activist organizations because they work with the so-called stakeholders, tell them what is the right thing to do and uh, they ensure that that is done. So, uh, so I think uh, there's a lot that you can do uh, in terms of uh, the environmental practice, uh, not just as an activist, but uh, in lots of other ways. Because I think uh, somewhere you have to also work with the government. You have to work with the, uh, you know, the say something like uh, Niti Aayog or uh, the erstwhile, like you had the Planning Commission earlier, whatever. Because they also need to be told that you know this is what these are the data. And 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 I have to tell you this. So not just lawyers. In fact, there are some of the uh, research organizations, some of the think tanks, which are exactly doing that, and they're doing a fantastic job. So if you ask them, they'll never come and tell you that you know. Uh, as a lawyer, when you represent this, you do. That's not the case. So I think just uh, ignorance on their part, people who say such things. But then the number of such people is also very limited. So uh, irrespective of what you do, you'll always have people who are criticizing you for good or bad, whatever you do. So I don't think that should be taken seriously. So this is, of course, a very wrong notion is what I would say. And uh, I think there's a lot of good you can do to the environment, to the society and to people around you, you know, uh, when you when you're working on these issues. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. So 
Thank you for those insights. And now I'd like to invite our expert moderator, Ms. Rishika Kade, to take the conversation ahead. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Yashwadhan. So, uh, sir, since you have also taught environmental law, my first question to you is, what was your experience with teaching like? So, uh, I think I mentioned that earlier also. Uh, it was a very good experience. I was very lucky to actually teach at a very good organized, very good institutions. Uh, you know, uh, National University, Delhi, OP Jindal Global University and all of that. So, uh, great institutions and uh, I had a a uh, good time in terms of you know uh, you could so i always say this that you know as practitioners also uh, we should be teaching once in a while because then you actually uh, tend to i would say learn and unlearn a lot of things uh, unlearn a lot of uh, uh, incorrect information possibly that you may have you know and uh, learn a lot of things a lot of development that has happened so and, and also if you enjoy teaching i think uh, uh, we should definitely teach. So, I would, uh, to answer your question, I think uh, the teaching experience that I had was uh, helped me greatly in my career. Also, because uh, there are a lot of uh, areas, uh, you know, which typically I would not be practicing, but because I have taught it, you know, I'm aware of what happened, what's what's the relevant law, and all of that. So that helps, and uh, it also helps, uh, you know, further. I would say that you know, it adds to your credentials in many ways. Because uh, if today I've authored three books, you know, uh, that was the time when I. That, that was a time when uh, you know I was actually researching and teaching, and you know I had this material ready, which I actually used later to publish a book. So I, I don't claim that that's the best book ever written on the subject, and I'll never do that. But uh, it's, it's, it's in a way, you know, that if you actually spend time collecting these resources, teaching and preparing, uh, if it can help students learn something, why not? And considering there are not too many books when I wrote uh, first book on energy and then environment, and now energy, environment, and climate change. So so uh, I think. Uh, the teaching experience clearly helps it uh, for any i think uh, area of practice it helps you prepare it makes you uh, better informed uh, i think uh, and uh, you know and the best part about teaching is you know like you'd have in a courtroom also you have uh, say 60 or 80 students in a classroom so unless you are thoroughly prepared you'd not be able to teach because you have all kinds of students who have read all kinds of things and ask you all kinds of questions so you have to be prepared for that and that will only uh, uh, that will only help you later in the profession, if, even if you want to practice, because uh, that makes you absolutely well informed and updated about a lot of information laws and everything that's there. So uh, I think uh, every practitioner once in a while, you know, maybe take a break from uh, practicing, go teach for a couple of years or maybe one year and then come back and practice again, because that that's really helpful. So I think this uh, exchange between uh, the profession and, uh, you know, academia, that's very important. And I think that started happening now because a lot of professionals also go and sort of offer these credit courses in various law schools. So uh, that's a very, very good development. So I would simply put, I think uh, my uh, teaching experience uh, was very good. And I and given a choice, I would always want to go back and teach. So that's always there. Yeah. OK, so my next question is, having been both a student and a teacher, how do you view the teaching methods that have been adopted in the Indian universities for environmental law? Because environmental law requires a lot of social participation along with classroom interaction. So, uh, so one, of course, uh, I think uh, the teaching methodology as such has greatly improved in the last, uh, I would say, decade. Because uh, there's a case law method of teaching where professors are clearly discussing uh, what's happening in reality, what, what is the kind of orders, the court's judgments, the courts are actually passing and all of that. Uh, so uh, that has clearly helped. For environmental law, I think uh, internships make a lot of difference because if, if you're actually uh, interested in working in this area, uh, uh, you know, the whole law school uh, internship program is something that you, you can actually utilize very well, whether you're doing a library internship or an NGO internship or trial court internship in-house and you know maybe a law firm. So, so uh, there's sufficient opportunity to learn and, uh, and not just environmental law, any area of law. Because uh, one, you, you're being taught uh, a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, cases where uh, contemporary cases where you actually get to learn as to what has really happened. So that's a great way to uh, you, of course, learn the laws. You do these internships where you actually go and work with people who are working in these areas. Then, of course, uh, many times, you know, the moot court topics are kind of very uh, contemporary and all of that. So once you work on any of these uh, moot court propositions, I think uh, you again have uh, somewhere develop an understanding of how the law actually uh, plays out in reality in these uh, kinds of cases and all of that. So I would say that uh, 
you know the there's nothing wrong with the teaching method as such i think it's uh, you know excellent as such and ultimately it's for the students to uh, you know figure out as to how you want to use that to your advantage and uh, take the maximum benefit of that because see everything is there around you i mean unless you work hard as a student and you kind of uh, uh, make sure that you make uh, the best use of the resources that are available for you at your disposal i think uh, uh, all kinds of facilities and all kinds of teaching methodologies and uh, whatever pedagogies or whatever will all be useless so that's how i put it yeah all right thank you so uh, my last question to you is that um, as environmental lawyers or environmental law students do not possess the expertise in the area of science for environment protection or in the area of economics of market that may hamper environmental law so because of this lack of knowledge in these expert fields do you think that this plays a discouraging role for lawyers or students to enter into the field of environmental law for careers or higher education so uh, i'll tell you uh, i don't think so that's my sense because uh, so clearly uh, you know when you have to become environmental consultant stuff you read you need a bsc your degree in science you get bachelor's degree has to be in science and all of that for becoming environmental consultant now when i started my five year law course at nalsar uh, i started the bllb honors program so that that wasn't really so of course i was a science student till, till class 12 uh, you know but uh, of course i studied a bl and uh, i think for any student who's really interested in this area of uh, law or area of practice you know uh, typically they would be reading a lot of stuff you know and uh, over a period of time you develop that understanding so you understand if you read about say animal laws you know what ex exactly is harmful what works what doesn't uh, in terms of you know treatment of animals and uh, uh, you know research related to animals what is good what is not so good if you're if you're uh, say if someone is a wildlife activist what is it that they do i mean uh, you know you watch these uh, documentaries on uh, say an animal planet or national geographic or you know a bbc earth and uh, you know that what's happening so i think see uh, if you have to become a well rounded and uh, you know a good professional it's not just about uh, uh, the law you have to learn a lot of other things and that applies even for corporate commercial lawyers i mean unless you understand the business how can you be a good advisor to the client so similarly if you want to be a good environmental lawyer you have to learn the science and that doesn't mean you have to have a degree in economics or science or whatever as you right rightly mentioned that you know the idea simply is that uh, you'll read and uh, i always say this that you know even a lot of people who don't have a degree in a particular discipline actually know much more because they've actually invested the time and energy and you know they've actually kind of taken the pains to learn a lot of things and they've learned it on the job so many times this learning also happens when you start working in a particular area and if you're interested you know it will always happen i mean you don't realize it but subconsciously sometimes you uh, you know you, uh, most of the times actually you keep picking up this information which is relevant to that particular area of practice and uh, you have to of course read a lot and you know and that will happen gradually it happens with time so i don't think uh, a degree as such really makes a difference yeah i mean if you have done some science related course or if you clearly have some qualification have had some qualification which uh, is related to that uh, area of practice which you want to specialize in that clearly helps but uh, if you haven't that doesn't mean that you cannot become a lawyer in the particular area or environmental lawyer and uh, you'll be uh, worse than some others no people i know a lot of people and of course all of us read such stories on social media that uh, you know a lot of people out of sheer interest they actually did a lot of things and became much more uh, qualified and better as professionals than a lot of others who actually had degrees in that so uh, there are no fixed rules but uh, yeah you have to have an interest and you have to have a sustained interest if you keep working in that direction and only then i think uh, you can actually uh, succeed that's what absolutely yes sir. so that is it from my side yashwanth you can take over thank you thank you thank you so much ma'am so now i would like to invite our faculty advisor to just take the last segment of the conversation ahead i have uh, two questions for you to sum up yeah. the entire interview uh, my first question to you is with so many years of experience in the field of law and into the profession what advice do you have for aspiring law students and for young law graduates so the way i see it is see uh, one is the typical uh, advice i would also give you like a lot of people would have given you earlier also that uh, there are no alternatives uh, to hard work and all of that which is true so see uh, i mean uh, if you're a student in a law school for 5 years there are certain things which are typically expected of you and one of course is that you have to be a good student in your class 
So everyone is not a topper. If in a class of 80 or 60 students, everyone cannot be in the top 10. But that is something that you uh, aspire for, like you know, aspire towards. And uh, so you want to be in the top 10, top 20, or whatever, 20, 25 percent of your class, whatever way. Um, and not just that. I think uh, you have to top it up with uh, some other, uh, you know, achievements which will clearly distinguish you. Because say if someone is looking at uh, 10 CVs, you know, everyone would have had a decent CGPA. But then what will make a distinction? You should have done some mood. Uh, you should have authored some, uh, you know, published some research papers, peer reviewed uh, in some nice journal and all of that. Uh, you know, so so uh, I think uh, write write a lot I and mean, you write a research papers try and uh, write in issues which where you can get it published uh, have some moot court experience because if you want to practice then i think uh, the moot courts in a in a, in a uh, great way actually uh, help you prepare for that so moot courts publications uh, good internships when you are actually interning it's not just about where you get the internship what you do in that internship makes a lot of difference because you may get an internship in a big multinational or a top tier firm but uh, if you're there, you know, uh, happy with the stipend kind of work you're getting and chit chatting in the cafeteria doesn't help. So of course, I'm not saying make it uh, like miserable for yourself. You have to have your uh, fun time and all of that. But then uh, try and learn new things and whatever little work that people give you, do it very sincerely because everything is a learning experience. All right. So if as a student, someone thinks that you know, I only wanna be an uh, I wanna be an arbitration lawyer and or say whatever tax lawyer and I only practice tax and will not do anything else. So I think that's a wrong way to look at it. I think you should try and do everything that comes your way because that's how you learn and you learn you learn well. Because once you get into the profession, you'll actually uh, be restricted to certain areas of practice. And then, you know, a lot of things that you may or may not have learned earlier that will not come your way. So uh, uh, these five years are the best time to actually learn and explore all possible areas of practice. Because then you also kind of uh, learn as to what is it that you enjoy doing? What is it that you don't enjoy doing? What is it that you're good at? Uh, what is it that you're maybe not so good? So you may be interested in something, but uh, you may not be, when you actually start working, you may not enjoy it as much and you may not do as uh, well. So so uh, I always say that uh, uh, you have to explore that. And I think your law school time is the best time to actually uh, do that because you have the luxury of trying out different things. In the profession, you may, not, you may not really get that time. So everything that is expected of you as a student, do that to the best of your abilities. And I think things will happen gradually. So you don't have to like be very stressed about it, but just be sincere and disciplined. And I think if, you, if you're generally disciplined as a student, you'll always be disciplined as a professional. And uh, so I think that makes a lot of difference. Yeah. Uh, so my last question to you is, uh, I think the, in the conversation you briefly mentioned about this also, uh, but uh, to elaborate on that, when and how did you decide to author books on environmental law? And uh, if you can please give us some insight into uh, your recent publication. So uh, I'll tell you my first book was an energy law, which I had written in 2014. And uh, the reason for that somewhere was when I, when I was studying in the US, you know, uh, and uh, of course I was studying energy, environment and climate change. So there were a lot of lectures and credits on energy law, the American energy law and oil and gas law and all of that. So, uh, and, and uh, somewhere that, you know, five years of my law course at Nalsar, I never studied energy. And my first job when I went to AZB in Bombay, uh, I used to work for a partner who was actually practicing energy. And uh, fortunately, uh, you know, when you have good mentors, they teach you things from scratch and which is how you learn. So uh, so I learned a lot of things like, you know, what was transmission, what was say uh, distribution and trading and all that kind of stuff, generation, all of that. So, uh, so I realized that you know there was no good book, and uh, clearly I had studied some few things in during my masters in the U.S. and uh, there's few things which I had learned while uh, practicing in that area. So I thought maybe why not sort of like compile that and write a book. And uh, when someone and uh, that was also time when I was teaching, and uh, someone approached me in one of the publication houses, would you want to write a book? And I said this is the topic, and they readily agreed because there wasn't much. So it wasn't like the best book available on the subject, but it was a good book which actually gave certain insights to students, as you know, because I think the idea of any good book is not just to give you all the information. It's also to sort of have you initiated that, you know, these are uh, so. So one uh, is just a desire to actually uh, publish a, or write a book. All of us at some point, you know, there are, you have these bucket lists or whatever that you think that you want to do in life. So maybe somewhere I had some thought key. I should also write a book and uh, gradually 
I wanted to write something which the publishers were interested in. So that happened. Then, of course, I wanted to write one on environment because I taught environmental law for quite some time. I had the material and all of that. So maybe just compile that and uh, streamline line it in a certain way so that it becomes a simple, uh, student-friendly kind of a book. Where uh, So one of the things I always say that uh, as uh, authors also, uh, of course, you have the choice of writing a very well-researched, top-notch uh, book. But then sometimes uh, writing a simple book, uh, you know, which is uh, easy to read, is also a more difficult task than writing these uh, well-researched books because you have to kind of break up a lot of things and make it sim simpler and simplify things for students to understand. So, so I have always believed that somewhere that is also a responsibility which uh, is there for professionals that, you know, so you have done what you've done. Why not share it with people? And uh, one good way to do that is to write a book. And uh, also, when you write a book, you research on the subject. So there are a few things which you also learn as a professional. So none of none of us are real experts in whatever we're doing because we're constantly learning. That's why you know, like they say, as lawyers, we practice. So I'm still practicing, you know. So uh, so I think uh, writing a book is a good idea. And one uh, for anyone who's interested, I think uh, first you have to figure out uh, what is it that you want to write on. Just check if there are books available on the subject. Uh, what is it that you are really going to do different from what is already there? And if it's already there, then you don't really want to waste your energy uh, writing something which is already there. So, uh, and also you have to know uh, your strength in terms of, uh, is it really a topic where you can add value? So, um, so I think, yeah, I mean, uh, the way I see it is uh, as uh, uh, academicians, uh, you know, and when you, so a lot of people, you know, when they do their PhDs, they publish their PhD thesis into a book. So uh, that is, I think, a great way to get a book published. Also, otherwise, if you're writing, uh, if you're teaching a course, uh, I think uh, you have sufficient material to write about that. And uh, and if it's an area of law which is emerging and uh, students would be interested and clearly will help them, why not? So uh, I think initially it was just a desire to write a book. And then I realized that I have the material, so it gradually worked out. So uh, yeah. So what is your most recent uh, publication and uh, um, is there something that you're currently working on? So uh, I, I, th I think I just published a book, uh, it's out, it's come out this month. So right now, honestly, so as lawyers, like once in a while, you know, you write these columns which are published in newspapers and all of that about uh, recent developments. So if you ask me right now, if there's any column I'm working on, no, because many times uh, if there's a, a judgment passed, you know, certain media houses actually approach you that why don't you give a quote, comment on this particular development or, and sometimes, you know, if there's something which is really uh, related to your area of practice and you think uh, you should write up about, that's when you write it. So uh, in terms of, since I've just finished, use the uh, time during the lockdown to uh, publish a book. So that's just come out. Uh, so I think uh, right now I'm not focusing on writing anything uh, because of course you have uh, your work and other things also to do. So that uh, doesn't really give you much of a time, and especially if you're busy in a law firm, then uh, it's also difficult at times to pursue these interests. So that's, of course, this lockdown was a great opportunity because uh, so that helped. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of writing that happens in terms of these columns and uh, you know comments and quotes and all of that. That is something we always do. So that doesn't really kind of require much of a preparation because when you're working in a particular area, you're kind of aware of what's going on and uh, that clearly helps. So, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I request Yashwa to please take over from here. Thank you, ma'am. So now I would like to invite a convener, Ms. Ayushi Hartwell, to please give the vote of thanks. Uh, hi, sir. I think we've had all our questions answered and all our queries resolved. I am sure that the experiences that you shared with us today will most certainly benefit all the young lawyers who intend to pursue this field. And I would like to thank you on behalf of the entire society for agreeing to join this session with us. And I really hope we get the opportunity to interact with you again in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think uh, uh, it was very nice of you, one, to invite me. And uh, I really hope I've answered your questions well. Because uh, sometimes, you know, uh, I'm not sure because the students also have certain expectations when they ask certain questions. So I hope I have answered it well. And uh, I think if, if there's any way in which we also as professionals can help guide or mentor students, I think uh, it's always a good thing to do. And it's a good break from your usual work. So thank you for having me. And uh,
it was uh, it was a pleasure chatting with uh, the students and the faculty members thank you very much